The Unshackled Waves, episode 192. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. This is another episode coming to you from the Liberty Fest conference here in Brisbane. Now this episode is a themed episode. We're speaking with the ladies of Liberty Fest. We're catching up with Bettina Arndt today, who's been busy going around university campuses uh, around Australia with your uh, tour on the the campus, Is There a a Campus uh, Rape Culture? So can you talk about what was the inspiration for this tour? Oh, well, I've been thinking a, a while about what I can do uh, in relation to, I suppose, the feminist takeover of all our institutions and the, the fact that there, we are seeing laws tilted systematically to favour women at the expense of men. And it seemed to me that the, the ra- fake rape crisis was a very good way to expose what's going on, just one little tiny issue, uh, to, to point people out the, the fact that feminists are distorting the reality of what's happening, for instance, in our universities. So the fake rape crisis is all about the fact that we, that the femi- there's been a long feminist campaign to um, persuade the Human Rights Commission to do a proper survey to prove that there was a rape crisis on our campuses. And they did that, and that was published over a year ago. And absolutely showed our safe our campuses of very safe places for most young women they found 99.2 percent of people surveyed had no experience of sexual assault using the broadest possible definition including being touched by a train on this you know on the way yes. to uni uh, being tricked into sex against your will so and that's a cause for celebration i was the only journalist in australia to publish an article saying that um, universities are real, this is a fabulous thing that our universities aren't crawling with rapists and that we don't need to be concerned about the safety of most women on our campuses. Of course, I'm not saying that, I always say one rape, you know, any rape is one too many. We have to take rape very seriously, but it's a good thing that our, we, you know, we can be proud of our university's safety and the fact that we're protecting women. Um, and there ever since has been this absolute conspiracy between the universities and this tiny group of feminist lobbyists to keep pretending there's a rape crisis. And I thought, blow that, I'm taking this on. And I'm very deliberately going out on universities to talk about this. And the, the main game is to tell ordinary students what's going on, to try to get them involved, to try to shame the universities into expo- by exposing their lies about this and asking them why they're doing it. Now, the uh, leftists and feminist activists at university campuses haven't liked your presentations at La Trobe and Sydney University. They have uh, uh, organised protests and uh, banged on the, on the, on the door. They, they're pretty much... <laughs> Well, it's what we expect these days, but thankfully you were able to hold your talks. But you, can you describe that experience? Uh, what happened with La Trobe was really interesting because I was all set to talk. I'd been invited there by the Liberal Club students to, to, who were hosting the event. And suddenly the, the administration turned around and said, I couldn't give the talk because it didn't align with the values of the university, which I think is really funny. I mean, the values of the university are to lie about this issue. Um, anyway, we had, we, I went to the press. We, there was a lot of uh, media exposure of this, and they ultimately backed down and let me go on. And they, one, and the funny, I thought the really funny thing was they, at one stage, said they might have to offer counselling to people who attended my talk, <laughs> which is, of course, the, the snowflake snowflake issue um, but they also suggested they might charge the Liberal Club students uh, security and we managed to talk them out of that so the trove went ahead it was very interesting because they we had the security there but they were given instructions really only to protect me they didn't even really protect the students who were forced to leave the venue at the end and walk through these very hostile protesters 
Uh, the process is I'd invited them in at the start of the talk saying, come and talk to me, come and have a discussion about this. And of course they took no notice whatsoever. They screamed at me from about two foot away with their me megaphones. And then throughout the talk, they howled outside and banged on the doors and bashed on the glass and did everything they could to make it very difficult. Particularly, we, I, mean, I got through the talk, but I had real trouble with the Q&A because we couldn't hear each other, the audience and I. And, um, so, I mean, that was, but that was okay in comparison to Sydney, where, I mean, Sydney insisted on charging the students for a security fee. Uh, they refused to answer when I said, well, what are they paying for? What are the instructions given to the security officers? Are they, do they have any power to stop the students who are trying to disrupt, disrupt the event? Uh, we got no answer in relation to that. The students were charged nearly $500 security fee, which I've got a crowdfunder, which is raising money for this whole tour, um, which is going to pay for some of that. Um, and, but the protesters at Sydney were really feral. Uh, they'd announced, you know, the key organisers had announced prior to the event that they intended to stop me speaking. That was their intention. Um, and they blocked the entry to the venue, stopped, most of my audience was still outside at that point and they couldn't get through. They were physically, some of them were pushed against the walls, they were shoved, they were intimidated, they were abused, they, they had all these, I've got videos out showing how, yes, they, how they were. Right? I saw a lot of that, and, and really, astounding. Really, and you know, it's very interesting for me as a, you know, that these young feminists think it's okay to, abuse me in the vilest possible way um, uh, and I suppose my favourite was being called a, a reptilian scum by one of the key organisers um, and I think we should go to the Human Rights Commission ageist discrimination calling me reti reptilian scum anyway they were pretty horrible and it was very intimidating very tough on particularly the young women trying to come to my or uh, to listen to me and the only way that talk went ahead is by the fact that the security guards ultimately called the right police in wow. because they were trying to push into the venue and it was getting quite intimidating. So Madeleine Ward, who's one of the main organisers, proudly announced that she was one of the organisers of the events, was in The Guardian this morning tweeting that they, well, I did, they didn't stop me from going ahead because the event, you know, I was able to speak. And the only reason I was able to speak is the taxpayers paid for, you know, what, 20 riots police yeah. um, to incredible. come and remove them. Just because they don't like your opinions. They don't like my opinions. And the, oh, well, I should say facts. <laughs> well, it is facts. I mean, I'm talking about what the statistics actually say. And the evidence is there, the Human Rights Commission data is there for everybody to look at. It's just that people are choosing to lie about it. I mean, the big move now, of course, they stopped talking so much about rape on campus and started talking about sexual violence, which they interpret to include sexual harassment. And of course, the Human Rights Commission did show there were relatively high levels, a lot of people had experienced sexual harassment, but they don't, most of what they were defined as harassment, what they included, was unwanted staring. You know, a male looking at them in a way they didn't like, or a sexual joke or comment. And most of the kids who acknowledged that it happened to them said it wasn't serious enough to do anything about. We're not talking about sexual violence or rape as we most of us would consider, uh, you know, applied to those definitions. It's something that the kids themselves said wasn't serious. And um, yet, the activists are now choosing to focus on sexual violence, mainly the harassment, they're fudging definitions, they're focusing now on the, ca on the colleges, you know, the big attempts to close down colleges like St Paul's in Sydney and to claim they're, they're crawling with misogynist violent men. It's simply a shift of focus because they, the, the, the Human Rights Commission survey was a fizzer. I mean, it, it pulled the rug out from yeah. under the activists. There were so many errors in there. Oh. Well, but the, but the point, I'm not, I'm not objecting to that survey because it showed the truth. <laughs> and they're denying the truth. The universities are full of vice-chancellors 
who are, you know, I keep talking about the Emperor's new clothes. The Vice Chancellors across Australia are totally naked, and no one except me is pointing that and saying, You have no clothes. They, were, they have been out there all this year posturing and pretending there's still a problem on campus, setting up 24 hour health lines for rape victims, setting up sexual consent courses. I mean, it's just ludicrous. Where is the moral authority of the heads of our universities? Well, I think the reaction to your university tour, it's helped spur on this national conversation that's mm. happening uh, in Parliament now about free speech on campus. Are you yes. pleased you've been able to play a part in that? Oh, it's been fantastic. I've been call I got a call from the new Education Minister, Dan Tian, and he's been bravely... I mean, I don't think we would have seen any of this from Malcolm Turnbull. <laughs> um, so I'm very pleased that the new government is, being, is speaking out about this issue and the fact that... Um, Tian is saying that universities have a responsibility to, to encourage free speech and to control feral students who are choosing to close it down. Um, but, but I've also taken action now to name five, five of the key organisers and the event people who in proudly boasted in the student magazine that they were organising this protest and that their goal was to stop me speaking. And I've got extensive video footage of them in action, uh, abusing me, harassing me. I've named that the university has clear regulations in place designing to stop students harassing and bullying other students. And I've got all the relevant clauses and I've put this all in together in a letter to the Vice-Chancellor asking him to take make official complaints against five key organisers. Um, I want them to be required to take responsibility for what they've done. And that's never happened before. Yeah, we're all hoping that that day will, <laughs> well, will soon come. Amazingly, I mean, the university's written back. We also, with the um, Liberal Club students, we asked for the security fee to be reimbursed because they weren't able to do their job. They, you know, um, and they said no to that. But they've come back and said that they are doing an investigation of these key organisers, and they want my wit me to give a list of the victim, uh, the witnesses, who to this event. I ha I included a whole lot of witness statements, which I didn't put proper name and address on them because we wanted an assurance from the university that they weren't going to be leaking their names. I don't trust the university as far as I can throw it. As far as um, conducting this investigation in a, say, in a proper manner. Vice-Chancellor Michael Spence has been lying all the way through. He lied about the fact that they took 12 days to approve the venue at Sydney University. We have the correspondence showing that, which I've posted on my Facebook page. And he claimed it was only six days, you know. Um, he lied about the amount the students were charged. I mean, he's fudging issue after issue. And so we wanted to make sure our witnesses were protected. They, they've now given us that assurance that they will not, um, they can be treated confidentially. So I'm really encouraging every student who was there that night who'd be willing to make a confidential, um, be part of a confidential investigation conducted by the university into what happened that night, please contact me. I really need as many people as possible who will stand up now and talk about that what it was like to be in that situation. It was very threatening for the students' concerns. Yeah. And also the role of these key organisers. We need to nail these people who have systematically disrupted not only my talk, but endless talks by people presenting views they disagree with. What right do these people have to to decide unilaterally what sort of free speech is allowed on campus. Yeah, the irony of the whole thing is these uh, feminists on campus, they're for women have expressing their own views and willing to speak up, yet they're intimidating a strong independent woman such as yourself from a speaking. A grandmother, a grandmother they're harassing and abusing. And in fact, the, the regulations include the students are required to show respect for members of the public coming to the university. You know, there are lots of codes of conduct that were broken by those students on that night. And the student, I think the university has ample opportunity to take action against them. So let's see what happens. 
Well, it's been great to catch up, Bettina. I hope that a few more university uh, clubs in invite you along, and it's been great. You've just done no, two talks, and you've already had an impact. We've got um, ANU coming up on the oh, what's that? The eleventh of. Um, or October in a few weeks and then the 17th of October I'm speaking at University of Western Australia but as you say I'd love more to organise I want to keep going as long as I can on this so if anyone who's part of a student organisation that would like to invite me I've had over three thousand dollars now I think it's nearly four thousand dollars donated to my crowdfunder to help me with the costs of travel so the students don't have to pay for that um, so we, we need this to continue I think it's I think it's been, I'm really excited at how, yeah. how we've create, we're creating waves. We're exposing what's going on here. And that's exactly what I wanted to happen. I will keep up the great work and thank thanks for Tim. speaking with us again. Okay, Tim, thank you. So we're here speaking for the first time uh, on The Unshackled. I, I hope you don't mind me saying the elegant Daisy oh, Cousins. That's fine. Ele elegant is perfectly fine. <laughs> Hello, nice to be here. Now, in your descriptor, when you uh, appear in a lot of media now, you're described as a feminist uh, apostate. So I'd like to uh, go back to the beginning. What, what attracted you in the first place to or what you thought was feminism? Um, well, I've always been right-leaning. I was probably... I used to be more moderate than I am now. I think you generally come, become more conservative as you get older. Um, I was a feminist, I think, because I thought I had to be. Um, it was sort of the last bastion of identity politics that I, the only and last of, that I subscribe to. Um, and I truly believed that it was an ideology about equality and about freedom. Um, and it just, it just seemed to be the, the done thing. But then I um, realised a few years ago that I was getting a bit suspicious of it when I started hearing words like manspreading mm. and mansplaining and all these kind of made up concepts. And I found that I was um, defending feminism, going, no, 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 that's not real feminism, you know, that this is real feminism, um, more than I was actually um, agreeing with it. And there was also a whole lot of gaps in my knowledge, um, which, you know, the things that are, say, presented in the red pill that aren't presented in the mainstream media. So I um, came totally coincidentally up upon Miley Yiannopoulos. Um, and after probably six hours of, of, of watching his videos in 2016, I thought, oh my God, he's just confirmed everything that I was um, suspicious of, the, the pay up, like the pay gap. I mean, I didn't know um, that the pay gap was an average until two years ago um, because it's simply not um, portrayed in the media. It wasn't until I, and that to me is extraordinary and I'm ashamed that I didn't Google it sooner. And the minute I found out that it was an average and not a direct comparison of, of salaries, I, I thought, wow, this all makes sense and I've been lied to. Um, so yeah, I think I was attracted to it initially because I thought it was something that it wasn't and I thought that that, as a young woman, that's what I had to be. And then I realized I was very wrong and thus I am now a feminist apostate. Oh, you're lucky you you left uh, in time. You mentioned uh, manspreading. We know that a feminist, it's not enough to just call out manspreading now. You have to pour bleach. I know. Uh, oh, my, oh, my God. That vi The viral video, the Russian yes. feminist who went around. It was a combination of water and bleach, wasn't it? She yeah. poured it on men's crutches on, on the train and filmed herself doing it. That has to be assault, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, sadly, everyone was saying that the that men, ju they just they just took it. They they didn't feel that they could stand up. No, no, exactly. And they wouldn't feel like they could fight, up, fight back because they'd know what the repercussions could be. But the fact she can just get away with that and be so brazen as, as to film it and not think there are going to be any consequences or not care about the consequences. I mean, it's destruction of um, property as well because it, you know, it'd ruin their clothes. Yeah. And it's potentially like, why would you pour bleach on anyone? It's, yeah, it's exactly. Cool. Uh, extraordinary madness, absolute madness. Now, being a feminist uh, apostate, now the the term apostate is used because in Islam, for example, it's very hard to leave uh, Islam, and it, you've obviously found it's very difficult to leave well feminism and speak out against feminism. Can you describe uh, your experience? And obviously, you're on the uh, Hack Live uh, with yeah. um, <laughs> is uh, male privilege a uh, bullshit? Where you got to uh, confront uh, Clementine Ford, so you've been in the lion's den all over the place yes um, look feminism is a cult it has become like religion in the fact that um, there is a particular set of principles that you must subscribe to and if you don't um, and you question it um, you'll not only be silenced 
you'll be punished、um, and then kicked out for your troubles. And that and that is、um, the sorry truth of modern feminism. And I found it very.、Um, Difficult to leave because of the reaction. Well, not difficult to leave in in terms of renouncing it. I was perfectly happy to go. Well, okay, I want nothing to do with that anymore. But the reaction of feminists to conservative women is just ex- extraordinary. I mean, if you think of feminists, they say that feminism is an ideology for all women.、Um, it's an ideology to empower women and to protect women. And the big thing they go on about is that women should be able to express their opinions in public spaces. Without feeling intimidated or copying abuse,、um, and I naively believed, in the first instance,、um, that this applied to all women. But according to feminists, it doesn't. It only applies to women that they agree with, and who subscribe to that set of principles that they that they lay out. And if you're a woman and you deviate from that,、um, you're considered a traitor. Um, to to the sisterhood, or, yeah, or and you're fair game. Yeah, or you're you're fair game. Oh well, she's not a feminist, therefore we don't have to treat her like we we treat feminists. And it's like they're either oblivious to the double standard, because I mean, all of the most quintessentially misogynistic comments that have ever been directed at me, whether it's about my intelligence, the way I look, or sexuality, anything like that, have come from women who claim to be feminists. All of them, and all of the. Rapiest, most sexually threatening comments I've ever copped have come from male feminists, <laughs> and all of them on the left. And it is the thing I had to go about at Clementine、um, about on Hack Live was her treatment of conservative women. Yes, I remember. Yes, because、uh, Clementine and I had a bit of beef on. Well, she had beef with me on social media. I mean, I started doing television last year. My first gig was Q and A, which is really being thrown in the deep end.、Um, And during that program, she started、um, tweeting things about me, and she had she had no idea who I was. Didn't even know my views on feminism at the time. It was just enough that it was conservative female Trump supporter.、Um, just you know. Stuff, stuff about stuff about my intelligence, and she tweeted, you know, we're talking about the Trump ban,、yeah. you know, just awful stuff, and this continued for two months. So she and I, I completely ignored it because I thought, well, if you ignore someone like that, they'll get bored and they'll go away. But she didn't. She took that as a kind of a pass to keep going, and so there was this intermittent.、Um, Barrage of sort of in, and never attacking my argument ever, just always attacking me personally,、um, which was dog whistling her followers, and she knew she was doing it. And so I had this. She, she had like a hundred thousand followers at the time, and I found it because、um, I wasn't used to it.、Um, very distressing.、Um, not because of what people were saying, because I didn't read most of it, but I knew it was happening. And the first thing you think in that situation is, well, do these people know where I live? You know, do do they mean me physical harm? It's very frightening. Yeah, in the beginning, it's in the very... beginning it's very frightening, and then I realise they all live in a basement somewhere and are generally <laughs> harmless. But、um, long story short, one night、um, after two months of ignoring Clementine,、um, I got sick of it. I caught sight of something else she'd said. She's talking about something I read. One of the things she called me was a boy suck as well, which is which is. I haven't heard of that term before. It's like a it's part in the language. It's a cock cock suck, a,、oh, a okay. slut basically. You know. And、um, I snapped, and I thought, you know what? Ignoring this woman hasn't worked.、Um, I want her to stop. I am angry with her for. I don't think this is fair. I'd never met her, never spoken to her, never said anything to her, or written about her. So I thought, well, I've got to hit back because ignoring her is not working. So I thought of. The most awful thing I could say to a feminist, particularly one like Clementine, who is overweight and insecure about it, <laughs> so I made a gentle crack about her weight.、Um, in the form of, I just replied and said it was something like, "Darling, sit down. When was the last time you could wear horizontal stripes?" <laughs> Which I think is was quite light compared well, to all of the stuff she's. She, if she's、yeah. slut shaming you, I thought the the feminists were supposed to be. That's their big thing lately. Exactly, exactly. So I thought, well, fine. I'll just give you back what you're giving me. And she like Twitter exploded, and there I was like, how dare you say that to this woman? It's like, ah,、uh, <laughs> you're okay with everything she said about, and not just me either, but people like Rita Panic. Yeah. There was a terrible thing she said about Rita. She said, no matter how hard she tries, she'll never be a white man, which is so racist, you、yeah. know, and 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 sexist and, and horrible. And all of that was what I、um, got Clementine on on the panel that night, and it was the first time during the whole episode that she had nothing to say, absolutely nothing to say. And since I tweeted that at her in self-defence, she never tweeted about me again. 
and she's never spoken about me at all since Syntac Live. Uh, her response was, oh, I was just trolling, which if, if somebody on the right uses that as a defence that's ne never accepted. Yes, well, it's her whole sort of diatribe that she goes on about kill all men, mm. you know? And the thing is, I, I know why she, she does it, and she's explained it. She says, look, clearly it's a joke, and I just do it because it's what I think MRAs think of feminists, etc. And it's like, okay, I get you're trying to be ironic and funny, but the problem is you're just not very good at that. <laughs> Do you, do you know what I mean? You know, there are there are other ways of doing it. She's very ham-fisted in her approach. Um, and it was extraordinary that she was invited to speak a, at a Lifeline concert. Yes. A conference, remember that. When she's, as a joke, tweeting things like kill all men and slut-shaming women who, who disagree with her. So she's, yeah. She's an interesting woman. Had a victory with that. Uh, Bettina Arndt, who we've also spoken to, she helped uh, promote that uh, petition. Oh, so, yes, the petition. So, so there's been yeah, small small victories. Yeah, there was, a, there was a backlash to it, certainly. Um, and the because the conference ended up not happening. Didn't yes. It? See, I think that was a shame because I don't I don't ever believe in no platforming people. Mm. Like uh, my preference there would be like, okay, fine, let Clementine speak and let 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 the reaction um, dictate what people think of that decision. Um, I, that would have been my preference for that situation, not because I like Clementine, but because I believe that sunlight is the best disinfectant and I believe in free speech. I think. But, but I if totally, um, the outrage um, directed at the organisers of Lifeline to that decision was to totally justified. I mean, why would you have her, her speak yeah. at a conference about mental health? Now, uh, as we have mentioned, you've appeared on a lot of mainstream media Q and A, uh, Sky News. You're a favourite of Andrew Bolt's on uh, every week, and of course, you haven't just got the, the Daisy Cousins Facebook page. There's also the Daisy Cousins Appreciation yes. Society, which it seems to post more than more, more than you. They're better at maintaining my Facebook presence than I am. Like that 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 page is. Um, I know who runs it and he's he's a lovely person and he's been extremely supportive of me um, in the online sphere and just generally and um, but the most awful thing happened um, it got unpublished the other day oh for no reason yeah. and we were chat ta chatting about it um, and he's like I don't know what happened I think I think um, it, it might have been a mass reporting you know that technique yeah. that where they all go and report a page but um, He's going to, they're going to review it and hopefully it'll, it'll go back up. It'll just have to be kind of Appreciation Society light, which is so unfortunate because it's such a great page. Yeah, he, posts, uh, he posts such really interesting stuff and memes and things. Mm. But they, there's a little example of um, Facebook censorship for you. Yeah, oh, if also uh, yesterday Fraser Anning's page got un unpublished. I did see that, yes. It's a politician as well. That doesn't normally happen, does it? No. Wow. Yeah, it's it's getting who's who's going to be next. That's the that's the yeah, thing. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And you've all also communicate directly with your followers uh, via your YouTube channel, and you've also got a Patreon account where you've accumulated uh, a lot of uh, followers there. So you've got that as well. I'm um, astounded by the kindness of strangers. Um, on honestly, because um, you know, there's a contrary to what the left says. There's not a lot of money in the Murdoch press. You know, it's very it's very hard to be able to do this kind of stuff and um, convey this message full time, um, and still be able to to pay the bills. So, um, in developing my my YouTube channel, I mean, the next step a lot of people do is a Patreon account, and um, if you, if you appeal to people's better better nature, the human beings are very kind and very generous. So I'm so grateful to the people who support me on Patreon. That there is an enormous help. Um, and I'm really finding the YouTube medium um, just wonderful fun and a really excellent way to, um, as you say, communicate directly. And I'm, I'm planning a live stream as oh, well wow. um, over the next to, to celebrate my hitting five figures, hitting 10,000 subscribers. I think I've got 16 and a half thousand now, I, th I think. So it's, it's um, come along quite nicely. So if anyone watching, please subscribe. Love, <laughs> love to have your company on my, my YouTube channel. But I'm um, having a great time with it. Yeah, oh, that's good to hear. Now, um, obviously, with your uh, TV and media appearance, uh, a lot of the what everyone tunes in for is what you're wearing. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm wondering if you're looking for another source of revenue, maybe a Daisy Cousins uh, fashion label that can come out. That's a wonderful idea. A actually, maybe sometime in in the future. Who, who knows? Who knows? It could it could be the next logical step. I mean, um, look, I love um, I love 
clothes and I'm hair and makeup. I'm very vain. I'm extremely <laughs> girly. And um, when I started doing um, the TV stuff, I knew that feminists hate girliness. Yeah. Which is so ironic because they claim to be an ideology that celebrates women, but they hate things that make women women. It's b- very bizarre. Um and I know that it really annoys them when I dress when I dress up like that. And also, I just thought it would be um, well worth it to bring a, a touch of glamour and femininity back to current affairs. I thought, why not? It's a it's a point of difference. Um, the clothes I wear are from an Australian black brand called Kitten Demore, who mm. I, um, you know, because uh, they're an Australian brand. I think figure, and I they're lovely people as well. I'm, I'm friends with a lot of the management. I thought, well, why wouldn't I? promote an Australian brand as much as I can. I'm a loyal customer. Um, and yeah, I just think there's nothing wrong with women promoting themselves as, as feminine. They shouldn't be denigrated or, or looked down on um, by feminists because yeah, of that. That's what girls want to do. And yeah, yeah, but they're told that there's something inferior about being feminine, which is, again, so weird. Yeah. It's feminism, you know. Uh, the, the word... Uh, confusions it's it's amazing oh it's amazing there's a lot of cognitive dissonance there about what words mean i i find well it's been great to uh sit down and and chat with you uh, on the on the unshackled and uh, keep up the great work i'm sure you'll uh continue to to grow on on youtube and uh yeah i certainly going places. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Lovely to chat. Thank you. That's it for this special Liberty Fest edition of the show. Now, as always, at the the end of the show, I'd like to remind you of other upcoming events. Uh, next uh, Saturday on the uh, 6th of October, it is the International Freedom of Speech Day. There's two rallies happening. There is one in Wiley Park, uh, Lakemba, uh, which is being or- uh, organised by the True Blue Crew New South Wales and Patriot lawyer John Bolton, who is also uh, at this conference. And in Melbourne, we've got uh, Ivy Yemeni and the Australian Liberty Alliance organising a free speech rally outside of uh, Docklands uh, Facebook headquarters there. There is also another rally happening in Melbourne the following weekend on Saturday the 13th of October, the March for the Babies, which is to, it's held every, uh, around about this time every year. Uh, It's the 10th anniversary of the passing of Victoria's abortion law reform bill. And so it is done to remember all of the babies killed during that time and to advocate for a change in the law. Also, the next uh, big name coming to Australia is internet television personality and founder of the Proud Boys, Gavin McGuinness. He'll be touring all the major cities and he's being hosted by Penthouse Australia and you can book your tickets by going to gavinlive.com.au. As always, we can't be at Liberty Fest and all these other things without your support, so please consider becoming a patron of The Unshackled at patreon.com slash theunshackled or like many of you have been doing is send us a direct contribution via our PayPal link at paypal.me slash theunshackled. So that's it from me for at Liberty Fest here in Brisbane and we'll see you back for our regular show in the future. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.